All right. Uh, I'm Thomas with Geon Technologies, and if that sounded really familiar to you, you may have seen a few of our uh, videos. Um, we are a, a medium-sized company, I suppose, and we spent, we started in 2011, and uh, in 2013, we started making a push into developing training materials and uh, other materials available to the community because our particular community did not have uh, those materials really available to it. And so out of that sort of bore this, um, this push to have a lot of examples and a lot of actually reusable code. And so that's where this actually uh, partially comes from. So before I begin, uh, I'd like to start off by just saying thanks to, or acknowledging really, uh, one of our own employees, Drew Cormier, who volunteered nights and weekends basically to help us get the base integration package going. And then Chris Conover was uh, one of our interns this year from University of Maryland, a rising junior. And he did an awesome job setting up the uh, component converter. Jonathan Corgan's not here, uh, and he was basically our Miyagi in all this, based, you know, allowing us to ask a lot of uh, really dumb questions, I'm sure, as we all were getting kind of familiar with GNU Radio for the first time. And then uh, also Ben Helburn was uh, clutch in helping us out with a number of things. So we'll begin with uh, you know typical overview of topics. We're, we'll start off with uh, what is Red Hawk. Some of you may know what it is uh, and be experts. I know there's a handful of them over here in this table um, you know, from our company. But uh, we'll keep it very high level, like from orbit kind of thing, so that we can just discuss terminology and go from the terminology to talk about why you would want to integrate with Red Hawk. And then we'll move on from there into the integration concept and just how simple and straightforward it actually is, because it's a very thin veneer, which we'll get into. We'll then move on to the uh, flow graph uh, conversion, how we basically take your flow graph straight into becoming a component and then distributing that. And we will uh, then talk about our Docker-aware GPP that really simplifies the provisioning of a distributed environment with um, such a large dependency like GNU Radio in Red Hawk, which is uh, generally a difficult thing to do. We'll conclude, of course, with some, uh, some parting thoughts about performance and other issues. So first off, what is Red Hawk? First of all, it is not your enemy. Um, <laughs> Well, when I started with the company, that's one of the first things that I heard uh, was that GNU Radio and Red Hawk were somehow enemies of one another. They were computer, uh, competing in the same space because they both do software-defined radio. But fundamentally, you need to keep in mind that Red Hawk is actually fundamentally about distributed computing. It just happens to be used for software-defined radio. So because of that, because it's a distributed computing environment, it's all about marrying up your resources to your actual uh, plan, you know, giving you your uh, signal data that you need and marrying that up to your algorithmic pieces. And so what that means to GNU Radio is you all have flow graphs that are uh, made up of blocks, but it's married to a particular piece of hardware, because you might have a piece of hardware that's an RTL block, for example. So if you can extract that out of your flow graph, what that basically means is you can take your flow graph and then just generically apply it to a distributed computing environment and interconnect it, potentially, with more flow graphs or other components. And so then you get distributed computing basically for free. So let's get into uh, some vernacular. Um, so that we can kind of talk about this a little bit more in depth. I'm keeping this uh, server environment kind of idea alive uh, because your flow graphs, as we discussed or heard earlier from, uh, from John or Jonathan, is that flow graphs generally get deployed in a single process. They are just a series of blocks, and you get one process on a single system. So whenever you deploy them, that's what you end up with, is a processor that's doing that particular flow graph, and it's generally having to be connected directly to the hardware. A waveform is different because waveforms get distributed across the, the, uh, the network. You can have them be co-located on a particular processor. But in general, uh, the idea is that you would have multiple components inside of your algorithm. You could have two of them end up on one general processor and another one off in a, a rack somewhere miles away. And Red Hawk is helping to keep all of that together. And so because of that, that's your paradigm. You basically end up with the waveform going into multiple spots instead of just a single one. Now, those individual blocks are similar to uh, your blocks. They're just called components. And again, they're actually separate processes completely that would run independent of the other processes. So there's no uh, inter-block scheduling necessarily. This is a, uh, an RPC mechanism. The data gets exchanged, and your block continues processing, and then the next one, and the next one. So it's a data stream. So that's the important um, similarity and difference there. They're similar in that they are the individual reusable pieces of your algorithm. They're different in that the component can actually go into other locations, and that Red Hawk is actually stitching them all together. So what do I do about my signal data? Those are called devices in Red Hawk, and there's not really an analog uh, to that in GNU Radio, because you all have blocks that are part of your algorithm. You have blocks that are part of your hardware. 
So there's a little bit of a, a tweak there. And then also one of the uh, base devices that we have is called the general purpose processor. And that's providing the execution environment for the component. So it's uh, considered to be like the host operating system where you run your component. Um, so it has all of the dependencies and other issues that you need to handle uh, in order to be able to run that flow graph. And that'll come up here in a little bit. Now, some of you familiar with Red Hawk know that the only supported operating systems that it supports right now through RPMs is CentOS 6.5 and, and 7. And that's a problem for some people. Good news is, Gion does not uh, see that necessarily as a problem, so we wrapped it in Docker. And we actually have a Docker-based solution where you can control or set up an entire Docker, uh, a Red Hawk domain with hardware, front-end hardware, all interconnected, plus an IDE environment, all running within containers. And uh, last Monday, one of our engineers actually pushed out an example for how to do that in a Docker swarm. So you can actually cloud compute with Red Hawk. Um, the other thing is, uh, Philip Ballister actually helped us out with this uh, last year, basically mentoring me on open embedded technologies. So if you need to target open em embedded systems, uh, we actually have a layer for that called MetaRedHawk SDR, and uh, numerous examples. One of them was the E310 SDR from Metis. So that is definitely available to you. Now, why would you want to integrate with Red Hawk? The first thing is, is again, about pulling that hardware block out of your particular flow graph. It basically reduces your flow graph's dependency on specific hardware and turns it into something that's more specific about your flow graph. It's the signal data. And we call that the front end interfaces specification. It makes it more generic to describe your flow graph's actual needs, because you would have, for example, um, a certain center frequency, certain bandwidth, and a certain data rate. It's not really about the receiver. And what that gives to you is that you can work in a development environment with your $20 RTL dongle on a specific frequency and scale up to your tactical radio system, but you didn't change your flow graph. You changed your receiver, and that's it. So that's the reason why you would want to go that way. The other thing is, is that by pulling that hardware dependency out of the local processing environment, what you end up with is using Red Hawk as a service for infrastructure. It's just infrastructure as a service. So you basically are piggybacking on all of that infrastructure that already exists in Red Hawk, and you're getting the distributed computing. You're getting the pneumo awareness of the GPP. You're getting uh, a number of things. And the last thing is, is it integrates really well with other ISR infrastructure like TOA. So if you're familiar with that, or if you've heard it mentioned in a meeting, we do have somebody here who would be more than happy to talk with you about that, um, but I'm gonna leave that topic there. So moving forward, um, we'll talk about the integration concept itself, which is, again, the thinnest possible veneer we could come up with. So what we've already said is that Red Hawk is basically gonna take over your flow graph. We're going to wrap it in a component and then run it inside of a waveform, because that's how we deploy things in Red Hawk. And you'll be able to integrate that with multiple other flow graphs, other components, or whatever you want. So because of that, the component's in control. It's going to be handling the starting and stopping of your flow graph, and it's going to be handling uh, tearing down your flow graph whenever the component goes away, which would go away with the waveform. So the life cycle is basically under the control of the component. The next thing is, we noticed that there uh, was a way to have variables in uh, flow graphs, so we pulled that up to properties, which is the way that you would control a runtime component. Now, if you have thread-safe setters and getters, you should be in good shape with this, but we've played with it, and it hasn't so far thrown too many exceptions. But uh, <laughs> we can generally control um, variables, and we can uh, also infer them, so we do uh, bother with mapping that. The next thing, of course, is the data ingress and egress. For that, we have source and sync blocks. And what's slick about these is that we have um, the actual SRI coming from Red Hawk going into your flow graph. The SRI is signal-related information. It's the center frequency of whatever device collected it. It's the timestamp of when it was collected. It is the uh, channel RF offset from that particular collector, if it was like a channelizer, for example. It's all of that type of information, including subsampling uh, deltas. So you have basically your X and Y axes coming off of your data. That's included in the SRI. So all of that's coming into your flow graph now by doing this integration pattern. What's really neat about the, the actual ports, though, what Drew gave us was they're actually Red Hawk ports. So they have portable object adapters, which means that they connect directly to the other Red Hawk entity. They don't actually touch the component. So whenever Red Hawk comes along and tries to satisfy one of your connection dependencies, the operation to actually go get the actual port ends up being returned from the flow graph, not the component. So your flow graph is directly touching the other endpoint, which means a lot less to do. How much less? The component does literally nothing. It has nothing in its process loop. It's a log statement, just saying, I'm alive. 
And that's literally all it ever should be. So because of that, we were able to write it in Python and make it very simple. So the component converter. Um, this is probably the coolest thing that I've seen uh, come out of an undergraduate student in a while. Uh, basically what the point of it is, is it's to convert the flow graph into a component. And it's a GRC XML to Red Hawk XML conversion process. But what we did was uh, basically employ the GRC package um, from Python to help us kind of get there. And in that process, we go looking for your variables and your blocks. And specifically, we look for our source and sync blocks in your GRC file. So we take that information, plus wherever you referenced a variable, we try to backtrace that to the actual type and turn that variable reference into a property. So we don't take the ones that you use to derive others. So if you wrote an equation, for example, that one's not going to become a Red Hawk property. It's the one that you actually referenced. So we have all of that. That becomes your lists. And then those lists become the project files in Red Hawk. So wherever you had the, uh, the options block, which defines the name of your flow graph, that'll end up becoming a part of the SPD file, as we call it. It's the top level project for Red Hawk. Anything that you had that ended up becoming translated as a variable becomes part of the PRF, which is the, um, the properties list, basically, for the component. And anything that you uh, specified as a source or a sync block, like you replaced an audio sync with our sync, that would become a, a port in the SCD. So <clears throat> with those projects, project files, we then run it through uh, a custom template that comes along with this and uh, Red Hawk code generation. And so because of that, you still haven't written any Red Hawk code. You have a component that just got generated for you with your flow graph inside of it, with all of its interfaces mapped back out to Red Hawk using uh, everything that we need. With a command line flag, you also get Docker awareness. And we're about to talk about that because it really simplifies uh, a number of things. Right now, the tooling supports simple-based properties, is what we call them. Uh, they're basically uh, your scalers, so in long string, those types of things. We don't do uh, vectors just yet. And of course, for data types, we handle bulk I.O., which is Red Hawk speed <coughs> for translating data. Excuse me. All right. <clears throat> so Docker where GPP, what on earth is that? Um, the normal GPP, the way that it handles, um, well, actually backing up, distributed computing. The whole point is to take dependencies of your, uh, of your particular algorithm and go marry them up with resources. And that's what the GPP is really there for, is it's a resource in the system that's trying to handle your, de your dependencies. So if you have a component that is depending upon your radio, you basically are actually on some particular library, like libdsp, let's say that. That would become a software package, and both of those would get deployed to the component during distribution of your waveform or of your component within a waveform. So because of that, <clears throat> you can imagine the level of technical difficulty it would be to take something the size of GNU Radio and turn that into multiple soft packages and deploy all of those with your one little tiny component just to get it to work, right? So what we did was took the standard GPP from Red Hawk and then upgraded it so that it could be able to talk to the Docker daemon. And what this allowed us to do is to take all of the components dependencies and bake them into an image using obviously a base runtime image so that all the delta images stay nice and small because Docker works kind of like Git in that regard, where you, have, you can have a large base image seeded off someplace and then your individual poles would be very small, basically the size of your component. So what's cool about this is that it allows the Docker GPP to basically run your component inside of a container completely different from the actual GPP's runtime environment. So you can take GNU Radio and embed it in this and not have to worry about installing GNU Radio on the CentOS 7 system that's running the GPP. So that basically means that you can do this in a standard Red Hawk installation just by swapping in or adding a Dockerware GPP to your, to your domain. The <coughs> base runtime image that I mentioned a moment ago, that is based on Ubuntu 16.04. And judging by quite a few of your displays, that was a good choice. It looks like a lot of y'all are using Ubuntu 14 up through 16. So uh, that should make it pretty straightforward to get additional dependencies into your Docker images. And that also includes Red Hawk 206 compiled from source in there, because it's based off of our Docker Red Hawk Ubuntu uh, suite of containers that are also, by the way, up on Docker Hub. So parting thoughts. Is the Docker GPP required? The answer to that is no. It is absolutely not required. However, keep in mind the GPP is your execution environment. So just like any other software execution environment, the GPP has to have your dependencies there. So if you can describe them in soft package dependencies, do that because that's a natural thing for Red Hawk to understand. It's, it sees that as a dependency, and it goes and finds the resource that says, I got this. 
whether that be an ARM-based system or an x86 system, since it can handle heterogeneous deployments. Um, but if you go that route, consider you're going to have to do all of the dependencies for GNU Radio, too. So that's the reason why Docker GPP makes a little bit more sense uh, in a deployment kind of sense. Performance, that's important, right? So this is a little bit of a sticky subject because uh, the source and sync blocks are written in Python because easy, right? Very, very easy. So we did that, um, but you're going to get a naturally a, a performance hit. This next number, please take it with a grain of salt because it was running on a five-year-old uh, laptop inside of a VM running Docker containers. So it got one mega sample uh, per second, complex floats. And again, that's like VM inception of having you know <laughs> a VM followed by additional VMs. So it's not really uh, indicative of the kind of performance that you're going to end up seeing. And it's not a limitation of bulk I.O. at all for uh, Red Hawk. Because Red Hawk, whenever your uh, components are being deployed to networked resources, it can handle all the way up to 10 gigabits per second. So it's definitely not bulk I.O. And when you're talking about processes that end up getting co-located, like we're in this particular example, they can head upwards of five gigabytes per second. And in the 2.1 and 2.2 series, you actually get shared address space. So you get the zero copy capability of being able to shift data around. So it can actually go extremely fast. So it really is just an implementation detail. And so naturally then translating to C would make uh, a lot of sense. And there's actually an example of this that we are including in a link at the bottom of our readme uh, for GNU Radio Red Hawk, the uh, repository, to a user that's helping us out with Meta Red Hawk SDR now named uh, Rodrigo Alencar from Imbol, uh, Brazil. And uh, his design is actually for wideband FM on an embedded platform, but his port design is really similar to what we ended up doing, but it's all written in C. So we might actually find that these two projects um, could easily merge, if not uh, extend one another to have some really interesting uh, further features and performance. Uh, as for more details, um, I have written a really lengthy blog post that extends this particular presentation considerably. We get into uh, a lot more details of the where's and why's of everything. Um, that's up on our website at that link, as well as a link to about a nine and a half minute long YouTube demo that shows the detailed example from that blog post, but in uh, you know, a shorter form, really. Um, so that's basically it. Your new radio, Red Hawk integration. We're not your enemy. We're your friend. We're an enabler. We'll give you basically the top four things that Ben mentioned yesterday, um, which was the pneumo awareness, distributed computing, and heterogeneous deployments. And uh, what was number four? Anybody recall? Zero copy at uh, Red Hawk 2.1 and above. So that's it. Any questions? We have 50 minutes. Because we're way on time. Sweet. Well, let's let's get cracking. Martin. And yeah, Jose can move over there. Yeah, I was hoping you could talk quickly about the difference between the licensing approaches of Red Hawk versus GNU Radio. Uh, actually, I'd have to let Scott discuss that. I get what, while Jose walks over with the mic, you can <coughs> take over and then we'll kind of interject that question over there. Do you mind <coughs> feeling that one, Scott? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can ask. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm John, and I was wondering um, are you guys planning on upgrading uh, and keeping pace with this whole um, uh, GNU Radio, uh, uh, was it 3.8 or, or whatever that has the YAML and the whole new design? Right, yeah, this is actually going to become a community-supported effort. If anybody is interested in actually supporting this or extending the design, please feel free to chime in. We'd be happy to add collaborators to the repo, uh, whatever is, is necessary, because I'm sure there are things that we probably overlooked, especially in the GRC package, about translating the uh, flow graphs. So we would definitely welcome the help, especially keeping up with the GNU Radio side of things. For the Red Hawk side of things, uh, we have that pretty well in hand, you know, keeping pace with whatever the latest release is. So um, we've, like Metarodic SDR, for example, we've been tracking the latest stable release uh, for the last couple of years now. And um, yeah, it's definitely in the cards. So the uh, license question? Yeah, so as long as you recognize I'm not a licensing lawyer, right? Um, <laughs> Red Hawk itself is distributed as LGPL, the entire thing. And um, you know that GNU Radio is GPL, so. You're going to end up with some mix of the two, but as far as the contributions we made, it's it's out there, it's available, and you don't owe us anything. Okay, questions? D did you have one, Jose? Oh, okay. 
Um, I just, I didn't fully understand the, the pain that Red Hawk would solve in the sense, if I have a you know, radio transmitter, let's just say, mm -hmm. and I'm going to connect it to a USRP uh, sync, right? It sounded like what you said is I would just take the flow graph, I'd make that, a, the, the tra everything in the transmitter except the USRP, make that a component, and then th the USRP is abstracted away, but I, that's not really, I don't, doesn't feel warm and fuzzy to me in okay. terms of like, oh, I need to use Red Hawk now. The main reason why you'd be doing it is you could have dozens of USERPs or other vendor devices attached to your, uh, your overall Red Hawk domain. We didn't really cover that topic. Uh, Red Hawk is a distributed system. Its entire environment is basically called a domain. So you'd have multiple devices as well as uh, for transmitters, receivers, and you'd also have your general purpose processors in it. So the reason why you'd want to be going this route is the interface getting to the user turns into what we call a front-end interfaces uh, allocation. So then you're just describing signals. So it could be a USERP that attaches to your waveform, or it could be some other vendor's device that attaches to your waveform. So then communicating back with it and controlling it is also still front-end interfaces. You basically have uh, what we call an allocation ID that it gives you uh, control over the device. And then through a simple port, you'd be calling uh, functions to set the gain or to adjust the center frequency or do whatever other things that you need. So the main reason for this, though, is, or to keep this in mind, is that you can also set up listening allocations, which means that you could have multiple waveforms all listening to the same stream off of the same device that responded to the first allocation. So you could be doing all kinds of additional algorithms hanging off that same piece of hardware, but now you're just distributing all these different waveforms out there to ingest the data. If that helps. We have time for more questions. I actually have one myself, but you guys can think about what else to ask. So there's sort of a general trend towards um, shipping software as Docker containers as opposed to, you know, like, I don't know, like CMake-based or auto tools based installations. Um, it's not exactly, you know, what you talked about, but, like, do you have any comments on that? Like, wh why is, are people moving towards sort of shipping containers instead of just making the source code? Um, buildable on you know on all, all sorts of systems, or just shipping direct binaries like Debs. I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for um, I'm the person who actually developed the original part of Docker Red Hawk, and the reason why I did it is uh, twofold. First was for continuous integration, being able to basically stand up an entire domain worth of systems in Red Hawk, so that I could actually run real tests with real uh, components and things, because we have uh, file readers that act like front end interface devices. So what we wanted was the ability to connect all of those types of things together and run it in a legitimate test, you know? And the, the best way to do that really is componentized because you can basically wrap all that stuff up and stand it up using you know, Docker Compose, for example, and it would be very straightforward to use. Um, the other thing was generally trying to use Red Hawk in the past, because it only supports CentOS, it means you have to start up a VM that's running CentOS in order to be able to even install it and play with it. By wrapping all of that into uh, containers, all you need is Ubuntu 16 or some other you know, relatively recent um, version of a Linux operating system and Docker 17, roughly. And you'll be able to bring up the IDE and everything in a matter of minutes. You just do a Docker pull against the uh, containers and go with it. So that was the main focus. It was basically like being able to say, I can now stand up an entire training and development environment for somebody in a matter of a few minutes versus, oh, by the way, sorry, you got to install this operating system, and then we got to RPM install 500 megs worth of this, and on and on and on, and it just turned it into a turnkey operation. We actually have a demo video for that, too, not to keep plugging the YouTube channel, but uh, we used a user B205 and got it up in five minutes, like, from start to finish. <laughs> okay. Um, the next presenter can actually start setting up their laptop while we close this up. Is there anyone else who has another question? Red Hawk, yeah. You, uh, actually, Trip, can you just, or Jose, whoever, move the microphone over to uh, Kellen over there? Hi. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the one mega sample per second thing. So you mentioned it was, so the source and sync were written in Python. It was just going to dev null, basically? Uh, no, actually, it was piping out to a display. OK. And Red Hawk ID. So it wasn't doing any complex processing. So No, uh, it was just a. Uh, five or six blocks, and I may have actually had something misconfigured inside of that flip because it was okay. just initial testing. Okay, all right, yeah. so I, I guess the, you said it was an older laptop, and there was also Python, and there was also multiple, multiple layers stages, VMs, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if you took that test and removed, like, how much of, I guess, the performance, like, you would expect 
to be a little bit higher, even though. Oh know. yeah, I certainly expected it to be quite a bit higher. Okay. I was actually very surprised by it because I know that GNU Red, or, uh, Red Hawk is actually capable of going much higher. Like at a bare minimum, it should be about a thousand percent more than that. Um, so I was kind of blown away that I was hitting that limit so quickly and it was inside the flow graph. It wasn't coming off of the interface of the RTL I was driving everything with. But you expect that to be a solvable Absolutely. problem? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Without question. All right. That's fair. Okay. That's it. One. Well, I'd like to thank our speaker.